Today we're going to discuss how to play multi-way pots. Multi-way pots absolutely wreck many small stakes players because they play far too loosey-goosey. They get in there, they splash around, they try to make hands, and their stack gets bled dry. I'm Jonathan Little from MyPokerCoaching.com, and today we are going to discuss lots of common scenarios to show you how to navigate multi-way pots well. It is very important to recognize that multi-way, someone's likely to have something. And if it's not you, it's someone else. And that forces you to proceed with caution, which is the exact opposite of what most players do. Let's take a look at some common pre-flop scenarios you will find yourself in. Let's take a look at this scenario. We're playing 100 big blinds deep in a cash game with no rake. If you're playing in a cash game with rake, you're going to want to play tighter. If you're playing a tournament that has no rake out of each pot and an ante, you can play a little bit looser. Let's take a look at this scenario, though. The low jack raises, that is first position six-handed. The cutoff calls, and you are on the button. Here's what you should do. You should re-raise the hands in purple to 12 big blinds, call the hands in orange, and fold the hands in green. Let's take a look at what is re-raising. Aces, kings, queens, and ace-king for value. And that's it. Notice we're re-raising jacks, tens, nines, eights, sevens a tiny bit of the time, but for all practical purposes, I don't think you need to. You may ask, why would we ever call pocket tens? Aren't we just going to get outdrawn a lot of the time? Well, the answer is yes, you will, but that's okay. The alternative is to three bet and then get four bet some portion of the time, and that is a disaster. Notice we're also three betting ace queen offsuit as a bluff, as well as some suited aces, some suited kings, and a few suited connectors. If you do three bet a hand like ace queen or king nine suited or ace four suited, and then your opponent four bets you, you're going to fold, okay? Do not get married to your non-premium hands in multi-way pots. Which hands are calling? Well, the hands that are calling are all the pocket pairs, jacks, or lower pretty much, some suited aces, some suited Broadway hands, and a few suited connectors. Everything else folds. This may be absolutely shocking to you if you've never seen a chart like this. Many players at one to no limit or in $300 buy-in tournaments, if there's a raise and a call and they're on the button, they call with ace nine offsuit, queen 10 offsuit, nine eight offsuit, nine seven suited, seven four suited, and sometimes even worse hands. And that is an absolute blunder. And that is why these players do not move up in stakes. They can't get a hold of money because they are messing up this common scenario. And if you want to move up, and build your bankroll, and crush your opponents, you have to start playing closer to fundamentally sound poker. Now, I will say, in most small stakes games, the, cut, the, the low jack player may raise a little bit too wide, and the cutoff player may call a little bit too wide. If your opponents are playing ranges that are a little bit too wide, what should you do? Well, you can call a little bit wider, and you can also three bet bluff a little bit more often. So, I would call probably every suited ace or re-raise every suited ace against most small six players. Also, the medium-ish suited connected hands become pretty good. And I think king, queen, and ace, jack offsuit become reasonable. But stuff like ace, nine offsuit, queen, 10 offsuit, 10, seven suited, all these hands are simply not playable. And every time you do, you're losing little bits of money to your opponents. All right, let's take a look at another spot. Here we are, low jack raises, cutoff calls, button folds, small blind folds, and we are in the big blind. Take a look at what we should do now. This is also shocking to many players. When they have to put in only two big blinds more, you still have to fold a lot. When you are out of position, your re-raising range is going to become way more linear, meaning it's just a lot of the best hands. So we see aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, king, ace, queen suited, a lot of ace, queen offsuit, and then a few other hands like ace, five suited, king, queen suited, king, jack suited, queen, jack suited, and a few suited connected hands. And that's it. That's all your re-raising. And you see the calling range is also very, very strong. You're not even calling suited gappers all that often. I mean, sometimes you are, but not all that often. The suited two cappers do not get played. Also notice the offsuit hands. Again, I would play a little bit looser than this. I'd probably play the ace jack and king queen, but all the other offsuit stuff is just bad. When you are out of position against two reasonable ranges, you need to play hands that can reasonably make very strong Post-flop hands and offsuit hands just don't do that. I know this is very different than what most players in small stakes games do. I cannot make this any more clear. If you're playing one to no limit, it's going to go raise, call, 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 call. And they're calling with all sorts of nonsense. 
And that is why these players lose. If they are, by the way, going to go raise, call, call, call with all sorts of nonsense, that's a really good spot for you to three bet bluff to something like, I don't know, 18 big blinds or 20 big blinds or 25 big blinds over the raise and four or five callers. And that's usually going to result in everyone folding preflop and you picking up 15 big blinds or something like that, which is substantial. Or maybe someone calls and then you play heads up with whatever you have. Now, again, you're going to see that uh, whenever you are re-raising, you want to have something reasonable a lot of the time, usually ASEC suited, some suited Broadway hands or some suited connectors. You don't want to go too crazy and start three-betting all sorts of offsuit nonsense. But look for spots like that where you can completely push your opponents around. Now let's talk about post-flop when you're playing multi-way. Recognize that when you're playing heads up against one opponent, usually one player will have a decent edge over the other player. For example, if you raise from first position and the big blind calls and the flop comes ace-king-jack, that's the spot where the initial raiser has all the very good hands and the big blind caller has a whole lot of junk, plus a few good hands. It turns out when one player has all the good hands and the other player has a whole lot of junk, that player is in terrible shape and they're going to get demolished in that scenario on that type of flop. However, multi-way, no one will ever have that big of an edge because you are taking your one range against your opponent's two or three or four or five ranges. So this is going to result in less frequent betting and smaller bet sizes when you do bet. And also when you do bet, you should generally be betting a little bit more linear compared to when you're betting in a heads up pot where you're often betting more polarized. Also, you're going to find that when you are bluffing, it's usually going to be with high equity bluffs like straight draws and flush draws. Compared to heads up, you're often betting with an overcard and a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw. It's like a pretty junky draw. When you are facing a bet post-flop multi-way, you're going to want to defend significantly tighter compared to in heads up pots. And that's going to usually be way less than the minimum defense frequency. I think I've talked about that on a My Poker Coaching video. Go back and look up that. Essentially, though, when someone is betting after the flop multi-way, unless you know they're just loose and splashy and wild, you need to proceed very cautiously. We're going to go through a bunch of examples. Do not get bogged down in the charts I'm about to show you. I'm mainly trying to show you the principles that come from these charts. So here we have cutoff versus button and big blind on 10, seven, five, two spades. So preflop, the cutoff raises the three big blinds, the button calls and the big blind calls. The flop comes 10, seven, five, big blind checks. What should the cutoff do? Well, it turns out they should check everything. The green color here is check. The red is bet 30% pot. Notice almost no betting. Why would the cutoff not want to bet on 10, seven, five with hands like aces, kings, queens, jacks, Ace, 10, et cetera. Well, the problem here is that both opponents have lots of sets in their range, as well as some two pairs and lots of high equity draws and lots of top pairs. And those hands are pretty good. Also notice the cutoff has a whole lot of hands that are just bad on this board, like King, Queen, King, Jack, Queen, Jack, Ace, Nine, Ace, Jack, right? These hands are just bad here. And because the cutoff has so many bad hands and the two opponents' ranges combined are going to connect pretty well with the board, the cutoff actually has to check close to 100% of the time in this scenario. And this is something that almost no one does because they've never studied these spots. They instead bet all their good hands. The problem with betting all your good hands in this spot and you know, not betting too many bluffs or maybe even betting logically with your bluffs is it leaves your checking range very, very weak. Imagine you bet all of your 10s and better in this scenario. So something like 10-8 uh, suited and better plus your overpairs. And then you bet with your flush draws too, and maybe even straight draws. What does that do to your checking range? Well, your checking range becomes pocket nines and worse, which is very weak. You never want your checking range to be overly weak to the point that all your opponents have to do to beat you is bet the flop and bet the turn and bet the river, because then they're just going to completely run you over. So you have to protect your checking range in the spot because your checking range is naturally very weak. What about in a scenario where... Again, cutoff raises the three blinds, button calls, big blind calls, flop comes, 10, seven, five. Everybody checks. Turns now the queen of diamonds. Well, if you consider what happens after the big blind checks, the cutoff's now gonna have a whole lot of top pairs and middle pairs and draws, right? So now this turn should be excellent for the cutoff and that allows them to bet pretty frequently. 
Notice in this spot, they're betting 70% uh, pot, 47% of the time, checking the rest. And they're using still a very mixed strategy. You're going to find that anytime you're out of position, playing No Limit Texas Hold'em, you're going to be using very mixed strategies where sometimes you bet, sometimes you check, which is difficult to do. I fully recognize this. But this is something you need to work on whenever you are playing against decent players in multi-way pots. Now, if you look at some of these hands that are mixing it up, like notice King-10 and is betting half the time, as is Ace-9 some small portion of the time. If you wanted to not bet the really junky hands like Ace-9 and Ace-8, I think that's probably fine. If you wanted to bet a little bit more often with the best hands that are vulnerable to being outdrawn, like Ace-Queen and King-Queen, that's probably fine. I don't think you need to go overboard trying to be perfectly balanced or anything like that against a lot of players. But at the same time, you do need to recognize that you are using very mixed strategies in this, these scenarios. Let's take a look at another one. Cutoff raises, button and big blind call. Flop comes, king of hearts, queen of diamonds, five of spades. Now, compared to the 10-7-5 board, king-queen five hits the initial cutoff raiser's range pretty hard, right? Notice they have lots of kings, they have some queens, and all these hands are very happy to put money in the pot. Notice, though, again, still mixed strategies are being used with a lot of hands that are opting to bet because you want to make sure you're protecting your checking range. I cannot make this any more clear. When you're out of position multi-way or out of position in general, you have to protect your checking range by including some good hands. Which hands are opting to mostly bet, though? So we see the kings mostly betting. We see some queens betting, but, you know, not, not always. And we also see some draws betting, like ace-jack and ace-10 and jack-10 are betting very frequently. What we do not see betting so much is stuff like ace six of spades, which is maybe a hand you would bet if you were playing heads up. Okay? Notice down here we have some hands betting as well. Uh, some of the bluffs we're using are six, five, and five, four, because these hands, if we bet and get called, they're probably not good, but they have five very clean outs to two pair or trips. So keep that in mind. Notice what's not betting most of the time pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sevens is not doing a lot of betting. Total trash, like 9-8 suited, 9-7 suited, ace-8 offsuit. These are just giving up. Total trash just gets out of the way. I mean, look at every single hand that's betting in this spot. They all have some amount of equity. Very, very important. Let's consider ace-ace-4. Let's say the cutoff raises. Small blind calls and big blind calls. Ace-ace-4, you would think, would favor the initial raiser a lot, right? And to be fair, it does, but this is not a spot where you can just blast off because if you blast off with, let's say, ace three on the ace ace four board and you get called or raised, it's not a good spot because both of your opponents are going to have an ace some portion of the time that's just not folding. And on top of that, you're going to be able to play a decently big pot against your opponent's ace X anyway if you check the flop. So in this scenario, you see we're mainly just loading money in with ace queen and better for value, right? It's also interesting to see some of the under pairs betting that are likely good but vulnerable, right? These are hands that have some equity, but they are very in need of protection, which is cool to see. And then we see some sporadic bluffs. These are a lot of these suited hands that are bluffing are going to have some sort of backdoor flush draw. So those make a lot of sense as well. But again, I want to make it clear, you're not just betting every ace, which is what a lot of people do. And that makes their checking range really, really weak. And if your checking range is really weak, you are going to get ran over. All right, here we have a spot where now we're on the button versus the cutoff and the big blind. So the cutoff raises, we call the button, and the big blind calls. Flop comes 876. Here we are. Big blind checks, cutoff checks. What should the button bet with when checked to? Okay, when you're checked to in multi-way pots, in spots where your opponent's range should not be all that strong, like on 876, the cutoff's range is going to be marginal here. This is a spot where you want to bet decently often, usually using a small size. And that's exactly what's happening here. Essentially, the button is just pushing their range advantage, the little range advantage they have, because they have a lot of very good hands here, right? They have some uh, pairs and over pairs and sets and two pairs, right? Plus, they have some decently high equity draws, like any hand with a nine or a 10, especially with an over card, right? So these hands in this region get to just straight bluff, no problem, and then you get to add in a few other bluffs that your opponents may not necessarily suspect, like ace-jack, king-jack, queen-jack. If you bet those in your opponent's fold, that is great. All right? 
These are all, I think this is a pretty logical strategy that most players use, but I think most people bet too big in the spot. A lot of players blast it because they think, okay, I need to bet big to get them to fold. But in reality, considering your range in general, you have a lot of really good hands here. So when you have a lot of really good hands, especially hands that your opponents will not have, this is a spot where, again, you, you just don't need to be blasting it. Let's take a look at another one. Button versus low jack and big blind. So low jack raises, button calls, and big blind calls. Flop comes, ace of hearts, ten of hearts, five of spades, big blind checks, and low jack checks. What does the button do now? Well, now, we're still going to bet some, right? But at the same time, we're now going to be using larger bet sizes because this board is way more dynamic. I don't necessarily want to get too deep into this in this video, but when there is a straight draw and or flush draw on the flop, but no straight or flush available yet, when you bet, you're usually going to want to bet somewhat polarized and usually using a bigger size. And we see that illustrated here. Notice a 70% pot size bet is being used a decent chunk of the time, mostly with hands that are almost always good but vulnerable, plus some draws. Now, again, what are draws on ace, 10, 5? You may naturally think, you know, straight draws like queen jack. But notice queen jack is not betting every single time, which is kind of interesting to see. We are betting with some heart draws. That's these slivers in this region. But we're, again, choosing the bottom pair to bluff. Notice 6, 5, and 5, 4 are bluffing a large chunk of the time in this situation, which is definitely counterintuitive compared to a lot of heads-up pots where bottom pair often just doesn't bet or doesn't look to put a ton of money in the pot. So again, you really want to make sure you're drawing to hands that are almost always good when they improve that also don't necessarily block the hands your opponents have that will automatically fold to a bet. So you'll see that bottom pairs very often used as bluffs in multi-way pots. Notice again what's not betting, the marginal hands. Queens, jacks, nines, eights, these hands are betting almost never. Because if they bet and get called, they hate it. But if it checks down, they probably win. All right, now let's talk about what happens when someone bets before you after the flop. So here we have the big blind versus the cutoff and the small blind. So say cutoff raises, small blind calls, we call the big blind. Flop comes jack of hearts, eight of diamonds, six of spades. Check, check, cutoff bets, three big blinds, small blind folds. All right, we have a new color here. Blue is fold, green is call, red is raise. Notice we are folding just the total trash. Anything that's total trash, we get out of the way. Take a look at what is raising on jack eight six we have some jacks not that many though queen jack jack nine jack eights two pair we have sets that are raising we have two pair that's raising here then we have some draws that are raising which makes a whole lot of sense like ten seven nine seven seven five five four queen eight actually queen eight's middle pair middle pair is interesting to raise isn't it again you're just being way more linear in multi-way pots Notice what's not raising, interestingly enough, 10-9. Why would we not want to raise 10-9? Well, it just has enough equity to call. So this is a hand we can very reasonably call. We're also calling some of our best jacks, which is pretty cool to see. Ace-jack offsuit, king-jack offsuit, queen-jack offsuit, doing a decent amount of calling. And the highest equity draws are doing a lot of calling. Also notice we're not raising every time with our absolute best hands, which is kind of neat to see. Notice pocket eights does not raise every single time. And I have to imagine if we had pocket jacks in our range, we would probably not raise that either. Notice what we're calling with, just all decent equity hands. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Let's take a look at what happens though, if instead of the small blind folding, small blind calls. Well, now we're gonna fold out way more. So before we were calling with stuff like king, queen, some ASX suited, etc. Now all that stuff's gonna fold. All the under pairs are also gonna fold, pairs lower than eight. So you see that whenever we are facing a bet and a call, even though we're getting better pot odds, we have to defend way tighter because it's just far more likely that one of the two opponents has something. Okay? Let's take a look at another spot. King, queen, five. Low jack raises, button calls. We call the big blind. Actually, sorry. We're, we're going to be on the button in this hand. Low jack raises, three of blinds. We call the button, big blind calls. Flop comes, king of hearts, queen of diamonds, five of spades. Big blind checks, low jack bets, three big blinds. Here's what we do on the button. On king, queen, five. Notice, we're gonna have a lot of good stuff here. But we don't get to raise. We see this jack nine suited raising. You can just ignore this for all practical purposes. This is a small frequency hand. We're only raising 2% of the time, so you can ignore it. Notice that we are calling everything we're going to proceed with, which are 
you know, all, all the Broadway hands, which have either a draw or a pair or two pair. We are defending a few under pairs. I would tell you just to forget about those in fold. Seven, six suited it's probably fine to fold that too. Six, five, five, four can obviously call with a pair. We have ace four and ace three suited with backdoor draws continuing. I think that's probably fine and logical too. But you see, we're not raising, right? We're not raising because the low jacks range in this scenario should be very strong to raise and then bet the flop. What if instead we were in the big blind now and on the flop, low jack bets three big blinds and the button calls. So it goes bet and call before us. When it goes bet and call before us, take a look at how much the big blind will now be folding. They're folding a ton, right? 80, 82% of the time. And interestingly enough, they're starting to raise for value slash protection a lot of the time. They're not really doing a ton of calling here because when you have a king, it's probably just the best hand a large chunk of the time. And if you call, you're highly likely to get outdrawn by one of the two players. You also get to mix it in there with some bluffs like ace jack and ace 10. Looks like queen 10 is used as a bluff. And uh, five, four again, you know, that bottom pair getting in there with a bluff every once in a while. And I think this is a pretty good strategy, especially as your opponents get a little bit more loose and they're splashing around a little bit more. As it goes bet and call on the flop, you can really put that caller in a nasty spot by raising because when you raise, now they have to... Well, first off, the, the initial better has to worry about the caller having something, but the caller probably doesn't have anything too amazing because they would have raised, right? So you're going to find that very often on the flop when it goes bet and call, you're going to want to be doing a lot of raising and a lot of folding and not a ton of calling yourself. So look, I know there was a lot of information in this video. Go back, rewatch it. That's the great thing about YouTube. You can watch as much as you like. Recognize, though, that most players in multi-way pots are far too loose yourself included, and maybe me a little bit. Also, someone is likely to have a strong hand, which is why we see a lot of somewhat cautious strategies being used, especially post-flop. If it's not you as a strong hand, it's probably someone else, so make sure you stay out of trouble. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the like and subscribe button down below. If you have a friend who plays far too loose in multi-way pots, share this video with them. It will change their life. I'll talk to you next time.